and I are calling a big Stanford win over Oregon in football. I'll take that, right? I'm a uh, class of 97, um, not quite the Stone Ages, but close. Uh, so I personally saw a few of tonight's inductees in action. I saw Joe Borchard hit a ball at Sunken Diamond so hard and so far, it cleared the batting eye at Sunken Diamond and it was still rising on its way out. I'll never forget the look on Art Lee's face when he was hoisted upon his teammates' shoulders after Stanford had clinched the Final Four, that incredible day in St. Louis. And I'm still exhausted by that luck-led triple overtime game down at USC. And that was 12 years ago, and I didn't even play, and I was exhausted from that one. Now, now for the inductees that I didn't necessarily get a chance to see with my own eyes, I certainly knew about their greatness well before coming into tonight. Heard all about Nicole and Corey and Grace and Melissa and, and all of their terrific respective accomplishments. Paul, Tom, and I were on the farm at the same time, so I read all about them in the Stanford Daily at the time. This was back when you would head down to the, stu to the student lounge in the dorm, you know, and you would actually pick up the Stanford Daily, a physical copy, and you would read it. This was back in those days, you know. And, and Lauren, of course, was one of the centerpieces of Stanford softball's first golden era, with the second one, I think, unfolding right now as we speak. All of these terrific folks are student or are textbook definitions of what being a student athlete is all about. And all of them help build and cement this place as the home of champions. But beyond their on-field accomplishments, all of these legends were and still are terrific representatives of what this university is all about. And that's, that's what makes a true Hall of Famer, right? Doesn't it? Consider these staggering numbers from the class of 2023. Five inductees were members of an NCAA championship team, combining to win nine national titles overall. Three inductees were NCAA individual champions. They accounted for nine national titles overall. Three inductees were Olympic medalists. They combined for five medals overall, three gold, one silver, and one bronze. All 10 inductees were honored as All-Americans, while multiple were also honored as their sport's National Player of the Year or remain school record holders in various categories. It's a lot of hardware. It's a lot of notoriety. That's a lot of, that's a lot of great stuff, a lot of terrific accomplishments. And after tonight's ceremony, the Stanford Athletics Hall of Fame will officially include 470 individuals. So let's get into it, and let's begin tonight's ceremony with Joe Borcher, now the 32nd multi-sport athlete in the Stanford Athletics Hall of Fame. Joe made his mark on the diamond while also producing some memorable moments on the gridiron. Joe led the Cardinal to back-to-back -back NCAA College World Series appearances, including a runner-up finish in 2000, while starting 185 out of 188 possible games in his three-year career. A member of three straight Pac-10 championship teams, Joe produced an All-American season in 2000 with career highs of 19 home runs and 76 RBI while hitting 333. An all-tournament selection at the 2000 College World Series, Joe batted seven of 14 with a home run, four RBI, and five runs scored over four games. And I remember he threw a couple dudes out at home plate too. That was pretty cool. A two-sport standout who also played quarterback, Joe made the most of his backup role in a five-touchdown, 324-yard performance that sparked a win over UCLA back on September 25th, 1999, still one of my favorite Stanford football games ever, in addition to playing in the 2000 Rose Bowl. Joe is the 48th Hall of Fame inductee from baseball and the first since Jeff Austin in 2018. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Joe Borcher. Thank you, Troy. I, I, I appreciate the embellishing you did there, so I'll, you know, I'll take care of you later on for that, certainly. Um, huge thank you to the university. Mr. Muir, thank you for everything that you do for us here, and um, just a tremendous honor to be up here in front of all of you today. Um, I, I want to make sure to recognize my family that's here today. My wife, Erin, our, our kids, um, Eleanor, Charlie, and George are here, along with my folks. Joe, Joe Sr. and Janice are here. 
my in-laws, Tom and Molly, are here. Um, we are the Tom, my father-in-law and I are the only two family members to play in back-to-back -back Rose Bowls, right? Um, and, and we did it the hard way, 1972 to, to 2000. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a there's a unique phenomenon that happens to a left-handed hitter when uh, when you're facing a really, 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 really good right-handed pitcher, and um, what, what basically happens, and it, it doesn't seem to happen with a left-handed pitcher versus a right-handed hitter, but it seems to be these right-handers that are just that good, the ball, the, their fingertips are so on top of the ball, and they release the ball so far out in front of them on the fastball, that out of the hand, it looks like, it looks like the ball's gonna end up in the third base dugout, right? So you'll hear any hitting coach say, you gotta see the ball out of the hand, right? You gotta see it, you, and they, the way they say it is, you gotta see it early, you gotta see it late. And so you're trying to pick the ball up out of the hand as quickly as you can and track it all the way and see it hit the bat. And so when these guys that are able to do this throw the pitch and it looks like it's going to have that trajectory that's way outside, and typically they're throwing like 97 miles an hour or something crazy like that, um, makes it really hard for a left-hander to hit that, that pitcher. And so we, when I was with the White Sox, we had, a, we had an advanced scout named uh, Brian Little. And everybody called him Twig. Um, you can imagine why. And you, you know, you make the joke like you could you could hide this guy behind the, the street post over there, right? Twig was so skinny you could hide him behind the wire on the on the telephone pole. And, and so we all called him Twig. His older brother is Grady Little, uh, you know, longtime manager in the big leagues, and, and just a couple of big personalities, right? And um, <laughs> they talked funny. You know, you're talking about cotton farmers from South Texas, so you know, real deep, slow. Oh man, we're playing this game in Shea Stadium. So he used to tell a story about Dwight Gooden. Um, and this is 1985, Twig's leading off for the Montreal Expos. And Twig's one of these guys, you know, he's gonna bunt, he's, he's, not, he's not hitting the ball past the pitcher like ever, right? But he's, he's a leadoff hitter in the big leagues because he makes contact all the time. His strikeout rate is like two out of 100 at bats is, is how frequently he's gonna strike out. So he tells this story about facing Dwight Gooden in a day game in Shea Stadium. And it's 1985, so this is a 19-year-old kid that nobody's heard about, right? And he goes up and he, he you know, he, <laughs> he tells a story. I hadn't seen many of these guys, but he was definitely one. And he's telling about the fastball coming out of the hand. That as a left-handed hitter, you just can't see it. And uh, <laughs> he goes up there. He sees. He doesn't see three pitches go by him. Next thing you know, he gets called out on strikes, right? Um, the other thing about Dwight Gooden is he had a really devastating breaking ball. Okay, so. Um, this is how good this guy was. You know, they, they track spin rates nowadays. Well, Dwight Gooden had a breaking ball that, obviously the ball's traveling to home plate, and then it's gonna break during its, its flight to home plate. Well, out of the break, the ball picked up speed and spin. So you're talking about two devastating pitches that are really, really difficult to hit. So Twig goes up there, he leads off a game, gets the ball thrown right by him, <laughs> and, and you know, you see this a lot with baseball players where the leadoff guy gets back in the dugout, and they, everybody's asking, what's he got? What's he got? What do you see? Right, what do you see? Because nobody knows this guy. This, is, this guy's brand new. And so Twig, Twig puts his stuff down. He goes, I'm listening to all these idiots asking me the same damn question. So I put my stuff down. And I said, I'm going to tell you all this one time. It don't matter. We ain't got no chance today. <laughs> <laughs> I tell that story um, because... I, I was fortunate enough to go play 12 years of pro ball, and, and it's, it's, a, it's quite a unique experience. It, it really is. And there are a lot of days where it can feel like you, you got no chance. You, your, your chances are very limited. And it's, just, it's just a hard way to make a living. It's a very, you know, there's a few guys that make it look very easy. And, and then, you know, for, for a lot of us out there, we go embark on this journey to go do this, and it, it, can, it can be a challenge. And, and I'm, I'm telling you this from the perspective of a guy that did not get to go out and accomplish what I set out to do when I left this university. And, and so, I used, I, I, in, historically, I would spend some time lamenting the fact that I, I didn't really go out and play the way I wanted to in the big leagues. I didn't have the major league career that I wanted to or certainly that I was projected to have. But um, you can imagine how, how much of an honor it is to be here and to reflect on my time here at Stanford uh, for the three years that I was here. And so, when we had the amount of success that we had while I was here, it, it's obviously with a tremendous amount of gratitude that I look back at those three years and what a blessing it was. Um, 
I, I played for tremendous coaches, and they they simply um, they, they just simply epitomize great human beings. And I have several of them here tonight. I have Coach Mark was here, Coach Willingham, and Coach O'Brien, Coach Mark O'Brien, and they were all kind enough to to join us here tonight. And um, I, I really encourage everybody to dedicate some time to finding them you know, at, at the reception afterwards and take the time to, to talk with them. Um, they are certainly coaches, right? They are coaches through and through. But when you, when you have the chance to talk with these men, um, really, really listen to them from the perspective that these are, these are fantastic human beings that um, transcended just being coaches at Stanford University. They were, they were absolutely stewards of, of this place and they continue to be stewards of this place. And so I, I, can't, I cannot express enough gratitude to everything, for everything that they did for me. Um, if you think about it, I came here on a football scholarship and Coach Willingham allowed me to play baseball. And think of the trust, think of the trust that he had in me, the trust that he had in Coach Marquis. And it really speaks to the quality of the human beings that we're talking about when we're mentioning these men. And I, I, I really want to make sure to dedicate the time tonight to just say a very heartwelt, heart, heartfelt thank you um, to both of you. And it, it is just with the utmost gratitude and, and just sheer joy that I look back on, on a, a three-year period that you guys gave me that I don't know how I can ever repay. But I do know, I can, tell, I can give you this commitment that you guys gave me a foundation for coaching that is, is unparalleled. And the kids that I come across that I coach nowadays, I, I certainly utilize the perspectives that you guys provided as I, as I coach young men now. And I, I have you to thank for so much. And I'm probably forgetting to say so many things, but I, I, at the end of the day, all my teammates that are here that were kind enough to come out and join us as well, a huge thank you to you guys. Um, really looking forward to catching up with all you guys tonight. And, and just uh, for, for a place that is as unique as Stanford University and to see the, the amount of quality human beings that are here at this place, it really is special. So thank you again. One more time for Joe Borchard, getting us off to a great start. Our next inductee is Corey Carter. Corey's incredible career received national acclaim in 2013 when she was named a finalist for the Bowerman Award, presented to the nation's most outstanding track and field student athlete. The 2013 NCAA champion in the 400 meter hurdles with the collegiate record of 53.21, Corey is the only Cardinal female to win an NCAA title in that particular event. A seven time All American, yep. A seven-time All-American, Corey helped lead the Cardinal to consecutive sixth-place finishes at the NCAA Outdoor Track and Field Championships in 2012 and 2013. The school record holder in the 100-meter hurdles and 400-meter hurdles, Corey was also a member of the 2012 MPSF Indoor Championship team and a five-time individual conference champion, splitting time in the MPSF and in the Pac-12. Corey was also a 2017 World Championships gold medalist in the 400 meter hurdles. Corey is the 15th Hall of Fame inductee from women's track and field following Lisa Bernhagen in 2022. Please welcome Corey Carter. everyone. It is so good to be back on the farm, a place that I hold dear in my heart, a place that played an instrumental role in shaping the woman that I am today. Receiving this extraordinary honor alongside such incredible humans 
and exceptional athletes is a deeply humbling experience. Since the moment Bernard called me um, with the news, I've had the chance to pause and reflect on the beautiful moments that Stanford had, has gifted me and to reconnect with teammates, coaches, friends, and family. It has been a true joy to relive these moments. Um, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you Stanford Athletics Department. It meant everything to wear the cardinal red and that S on my chest. What's interesting about track and field is that while it may seem like an individual sport on the surface, I never once felt alone in my journey. While reminiscing about my time here, I came across this photo of me anchoring the 4x4 at Big Meet, and I'm running through a tunnel of my teammates cheering for me, urging me to beat Cal. And that really encapsulated my Stanford experience, a journey where you're striving to be better and chasing your dreams, all while being surrounded by people who encourage you every step of the way. There are countless individuals who poured their support and effort into my journey, often behind the scenes, unnoticed by others, but so meaningful to me. First and foremost, I wanna thank my family who have been with me since my very first steps on the track to this moment here today. Um, now, my mom may not have been a sports fan, but she did know that I was a lot more pleasant to be around when I won. <laughs> so she shape-shifted and transformed into my personal chef, my masseuse, my cheerleader, my prayer warrior, doing anything and everything she could to support me. On the other hand, my dad, my first coach, instilled in me the importance of giving it my all. Um, I still remember one of his first lessons he taught me, which was, when playing basketball, if you're gonna get a foul, someone better be on the floor. <laughs> Sports became our bonding ground, and I owe much of my confidence and my work ethic to him. I'm also very grateful for his advice, where he told me if I went to USC, people would think of me as fast, but if I went to Stanford, people would think of me as smart. I couldn't ask for better role models than my older sisters, Kai and Kelly. They made excellence the norm in my household and made me truly believe that anything was possible. I just had to follow their footsteps. My little brother, Brennan, was my fiercest competition in every backyard battle, and my siblings instilled in me the fearlessness I needed to tackle the world. My teammates at Stanford pushed me to be better and helped me survive Coach Flo's crazy workouts. Among them, Kelly Schuler stands out as the best training partner I have ever had. Kelly is one of the hardest working people I know. She would lead every rep of our workouts, she would give me the inside lane, she was always on pace, and she never complained. I loved being her teammate because her selflessness made hard work easy. And then because she's also one of the smartest people I know, she would tutor me in human biology after practice. <laughs> All of my teammates, inspired me to push harder and reach higher. Coach Andy Ward taught me that it is that the little things make the biggest difference. His dedication played a pivotal role in my success. He would make me come into the weight room before and after practice, and then again on my off days for weakness Wednesdays. I'm truly thankful for the extra hours he invested in helping me achieve my goals. When I wasn't in the weight room, I was often in the training room bothering Matt and Lee, our PTs, who not only kept my body together, but also calmed my mind before races, whether that was with an encouraging word or making me laugh. And then there was Flo, Coach Edric Floreal. I know that I've given that man more than a few gray hairs because I've made it my personal mission to constantly test his patience. Meeting Coach Flo changed my life as he held dreams and aspirations for me that exceeded even my own. He told me the accomplishments I, that we would achieve long before we made them a reality. There are times when I would push back, but um, since Coach Flo can't be here tonight, I can finally admit that he was right. <laughs> I am forever grateful for his fearless leadership and for getting in the trenches with me every day, working tirelessly to make sure that vision came true. I often say that Flo cares about me too much to settle for anything less 
than my absolute best, and he would do whatever it took to bring that out of me. When I think about the kind of leader I aspire to be, I often draw from the lessons Coach Lowe instilled in me, and I'm so glad that we turned a four-year commitment into a lifelong bond. There are countless stories and numerous individuals I would like to thank for helping me reach this moment. For my friends and family who would cheer me on, to my coaches and teammates who put, pushed me to be better. Every achievement I have accomplished is a testament to the hard work and sacrifices of others. I'm genuinely humbled to be considered among such incredible people. Going to Stanford was a dream come true and con continues to open doors for me. I'm grateful for the journey because of all the company I've had along the way. Thank you for being here tonight and for sharing this special one with me. So. And that's one of the best comparisons between USC and Stanford that I've, I've ever heard. I, I, gotta, I gotta remember that. Then again, maybe I don't have to remember that. Who knows, whatever. Our next inductee is Grace Batal Luzak. Grace enjoyed success at every level during her career, cementing her status as one of the prolific rowers in school history. In 2009, Grace powered the Cardinal to its first NCAA championship in school history as a member of the NCAA champion Varsity 8. Grace was a three-time All-American from 2009 to 2011, earning second-team honors in each and every season. She was dominant at the conference level. In addition to being named the two-time All-Pac-10 selection and two-time Pac-10 All-Academic honoree, Grace was named to the Pac-12 All-Century team in 2016 as part of the conference's centennial celebration. On the international stage, Grace was a three-time world champion, multiple World Cup medalist, and two-time Olympian representing Team USA in 2016 and in 2020. Grace is the third Hall of Fame inductee from women's rowing and the first since Elle Logan in 2021. Please welcome Grace Fatal Luzak. So as a lot of our athletes here have been, uh, you kind of get preoccupied with your sport. Um, and I've never been to uh, any of my graduations. So there's a collective sigh of relief that it actually happened from my family. <laughs> so my family um, has a pretty strong background with sport. My uncle here was a football player, my dad was a boxer and played rugby. So naturally with all these physical like brawn talents, I picked a zero percent contact sport of rowing. <laughs> um, but I actually found rowing thanks to my mom and my sister and the Wall Street Journal. My mom was reading the Wall Street Journal one day and the article read, do you have tall daughters? My mom was like, yes. <laughs> do you want them to go to college for free? Why not? <laughs> have them try rowing. Um, and luckily, my sister was okay with sharing and me doing literally everything the same, she, the same thing that she did. So it was the same room, same sports, same camps, same clothes. Well, maybe not the last one. Um, but my sophomore year um, was actually my first year at Stanford. I transferred, and you know, some, some of us just don't get it right the first time, but we do eventually. <laughs> and um, one of the first things I learned about uh, was all of our great Stanford traditions. And on the rowing team, we have a tradition with every person getting a nickname. So it's like these ferocious, intimidating nicknames like the rock, the fridge, the locomotive, um, and I got racing grace. And um, it took me a couple years to upgrade, but thanks to my new last name of Fatal and my husband Mike, um, I am now Femme Fatal. <laughs> <laughs> 
Stanford traditions obviously extend, I'm sure everyone in this room can relate to problem sets. I actually saw my um, architecture professor here as well, and I felt like I walked back into a dream where I was like, did I f complete my final? Did I complete my problem sets? <laughs> Am I in trouble? <laughs> um, so there are these, like, these problem sets are these big, like, you know, weekly sagas of work, and um, one year I took a financial accounting class, and it was an all-athlete study group where we got together um, for this class. It was Seabass from the volleyball team, Josh Owens from the basketball team, and myself. And it was the best group. We were so efficient, because we had to be. <laughs> Josh was gone half the week because he was traveling with basketball. I was up early in the morning. I couldn't meet late. Like, volleyball was all over the place, and they had a lot of work to do. Um, so I think moral of the story is athletes get the work done and get it done fast. Um, so after graduation, I started training for the U.S. team, and I left behind Stanford's world of organic vegetables, Sunday unlimited Indian food over at Flomo, our Saturday post-practice team brunches, and stepped into a world of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, Costco chickens, and Ben and & Jerry's ice cream pints on sale because it's not exactly the most lucrative career to choose to do um, Olympic rowing in your future. So in order to train, we trained in Princeton, New, uh, New Jersey, and we lived with host families, which is essentially like being a foreign exchange student, but you're American. <laughs> and instead of being a high school kid, you're in your 20s and 30s. <laughs> so two of those amazing people, the Covens, are here tonight, um, and they opened up their homes, their lives, their fridges um, to all of our Olympic hopefuls. And I'm actually one of many. I think they've had like 20, 30, maybe even more rowers um, go into their home and put up with us taking naps between practice and, as I said, devouring the fridge. So thank you, Covens and to all my other host families as well. So rowing essentially is a sport where you sit down, uh, go backwards, and you do the same thing over and over again. <laughs> so it was fitting that for Tokyo during our pandemic year that it was a repeat year doing the same thing again. Um, during lockdown, uh, I'm hugely thankful for my husband being my mostly willing training partner because <laughs> Otherwise, I'm not sure I would have gotten off the couch. Um, so thank you, Mike, for always keeping me working and staying fit. And um, I'm really thankful, too, for my family that can't be here tonight. My brother has a seven-week-old baby and is home in Chicago. And sadly, I had two grandparents pass away this year who were definitely my biggest fans. And um, the fridges were full of news clippings and... Um, really appreciate all of their support throughout the years. Um, and also a fun surprise because one of my rowing teammates was here tonight. Um, so Jenna, who happens to be um, the preschool teacher for Andrew Lux, um, toddler here. <laughs> She's here, so I'm like super thankful to have um, teammates as well. And of course, as mentioned, I think the, the rowing team won the national championships this last year, which was so exciting. <laughs> So looking forward to many more, and go card. Grace, I'm just glad I'm not the only one who still has those momentary flashbacks where it's like, oh wait, did, did I really graduate? I, I think I did. Okay, good, good to know, thank you. The fourth member of the class of 2023 is Nicole Gibbs. Women's tennis, the all-time winningest sport on the farm, has had its share of elite performers, and Nicole's three-year career ranks among the very best. 2012 National Player of the Year, she fueled Stanford to an NCAA championship in 2013. 
Nicole is a three-time NCAA champion, claiming back-to-back -back singles crowns in 2012 and in 2013, while also winning doubles in 2012. That makes her the only, only the third player in NCAA history to win both in the same season and joining Linda Gates as the only two Cardinal players to complete a career title sweep, team, singles, and doubles. A five-time All-American, Nicole's overall singles record was 111 and 15 overall, and 30 and one in NCAA team and individual play combined. A two-time Honda Sport Award recipient, Nicole went on to play professionally and reached a career-high number 68 world singles ranking in 2016. Nicole is the 19th Hall of Fame inductee from the women's tennis, from women's tennis, and the first since Susan Hagee and Diane Morrison in 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nicole Gibbs. Wow, what a crazy honor to be here today. I don't even mean being inducted into the Hall of Fame, just to be considered a member of the Stanford Athletics community and to feel welcome here has been such a surreal honor for me over the years. Stanford tennis was always the ultimate goal and the ultimate dream for me. The wins, the titles, the shared triumphs with my teammates and my pro career after my time here were honestly all just icing on the cake. When I was about 11 years old and really started to stand out in tennis, I turned, out, uh, I turned to my dad during practice one day and said, hey dad, what college has the absolute best combination of athletics and academics in the world? I think he answered with a list actually, but the first word out of his mouth was Stanford and from that moment on, I never looked back. It was my singular goal to get here and to wear the block S, and I can now confidently say that I owe, owe my experience at Stanford for pretty much every inch of my life as it is today. Certainly for the success I enjoyed in tennis, but also this is where I met my life partner, Jack, and together we have the most amazing 18-month-old daughter, Sky. I want to briefly mention a list of people that helped me along the way during my Stanford career. First and foremost, to my scholarship donors, Linda and Tony Meyer, without you, Stanford would not have been a viable option for me. To the entire athletic training staff, and specifically Myra Bremen and Katie Suskin Rizzo, thank you for the enormous amount of time and effort spent keeping me healthy and fit to play. Thank you to Andy Choi over at the PT and Rehabilitation Center for all of the hard work getting me back to full health after several acute injuries. Thank you to Jason Kwan and the fitness department, who put our teams through enormous amounts of torture in the gym, most infamously Friday morning 7 a.m. runs. But I know those uncomfortable efforts are what made us so re resilient in the toughest moments of competition. Thank you to Brian Rizzo and the comms team for all of the many press releases, write-ups, social media management, and overall hard work that goes into promoting our sport. The biggest thank yous, of course, are reserved for my teammates, who push me every single day to get better and to work harder and to be an all-around better person, sometimes under immense pressure. College tennis is funny because we've been told our whole lives that tennis is an individual sport. We need to be selfish and put ourselves first. Then suddenly, you're thrown into a team environment, and let's just say it doesn't always work out that college tennis teams gel well and get along great. I feel so lucky that I was surrounded by a bunch of women who were all fiercely competitive with each other, but also genuinely wanted the best for one another. Sometimes that required tough love, but more often than not, the environment was remarkably supportive and didn't allow you to feel down on yourself for too long without someone stopping to help you back up. Finally, Lily Farood and Frankie Brennan. We are all clearly looking forward to their eventual Hall of Fame inductions because these two know how to win in a way that is just relentless and confidence inspiring. It is difficult to take any personal credit for successes achieved under their care because of how enormously prolific they've been over the years. Season after season, including the year our team won in 2013, it looks like Stanford tennis might just have their backs against the wall. And time and time again, Lily and Frankie inspire their team to believe that they're champions and to overcome the odds. 
Perhaps even more importantly, Lily and Frankie take the view that their athletes are humans first, athletes and students equally second. At so many programs that I looked at during my recruitment process, it was evident that tennis would be first and everything else, even academics, would have to come second. With Lily and Frankie, accommodations were constantly made to allow us to thrive in the classroom, and I was given full autonomy to participate in every inch of collegiate life. For this, I'm more grateful than for any other individual gift of wisdom or coaching. There are about a million other people that I could directly thank, not least of all my friends and family who supported me through every phase of my tennis journey. But in the interest of time, I'm going to end with a brief story that I think illustrates the power of my Stanford athletics experience. So anyone who knows me well knows that I had a complicated relationship to tennis throughout my career. I love to compete and I love to win, but my passion for the sport itself was sometimes tenuous at best. A few weeks ago, I was chatting with an old teammate, Carol Zhao, over text. She's still competing on tour, and when I asked her where in the world she was this week, she replied, Stanford. Evidently, pro tennis had returned to the farm, and now being a mom and firmly out of the loop on the tennis tour, I hadn't realized. I replied, oh, no way, jealous. Carol, who's accustomed to me saying I don't miss life on tour at all, replied, really? And before I could really even think it through, my fingers had typed out, well, yes, Stanford was the only place I ever really loved to play tennis. Thank you to the athletics department and Bernard Muir for this incredible honor. I hope everyone has an amazing night celebrating this wildly talented class of athletes. Thank you. Nicole Gibbs, heck of a speech, well done. That was fun. Are, are we having a good time? Are we enjoying this? Okay, all right. Well, if you're into tennis, if you wanna keep it going, that's what we're gonna do right here on the men's side with Paul Goldstein. Paul, of course, is now the program's head coach, but he's being recognized tonight for his student-athlete career here on the farm, a member of four consecutive NCAA championship teams from 1995 to 1998, marking the first time in NCAA men's college tennis history that feat had been achieved. A five-time All-American who finished with a career singles record of 116 and 27 overall. Paul was the 1998 NCAA singles runner-up, falling to teammate Bob Bryan in an All-Stanford final. One of the most well-respected players of his era, Paul was a two-time ITA Arthur Ashe Jr. Sportsmanship and Leadership Award winner and also received the ITA Rafael Osuna Sportsmanship Award. Paul's 10-year professional career included career-high world rankings of number 58 in singles and number 40 in doubles. Now in his 10th year as the Toby Family Director of Men's Tennis, Paul has led the Cardinal to eight NCAA appearances. Paul is the 33rd Hall of Fame inductee from Men's Tennis and the first since Bob Bryan and Mike Bryan in 2021. Please welcome Paul Goldstein. I get to follow Nicole. If you've never seen her play, Gibsy is the best competitor, the most fiercest competitor this, these walls have ever seen. Uh, Troy, thank <laughs> Troy, thanks for those kind words and the introduction. I could have done it without the Stone Age comment in your, uh, in your intro because we are contemporaries. Uh, it's, an it's a tremendous honor to be here tonight, um, and there are so many people for me to thank, and I just know that I will not get to all of them. Please know that um, I am grateful to everyone who made this journey possible for me. Uh, I have these remarks planned, but I'm already going to go off, off script because I was sitting on a panel with Andrew Luck earlier today, and he said, and he asked a bunch of us, what are you most excited about today? And I don't think he literally meant today, he meant in general, but I took it as today, and I thought about it, and um, 
I'm so grateful for the opportunity to acknowledge this place, to thank, to express my gratitude to all the people who made my experience here so meaningful. Um, in my four years, as Troy said, we had the fortune of winning four consecutive NCAA team championships that had never happened before. In the entirety of my career, I was lifted up by amazing teammates, coaches, friends, family, and supporters. And tonight, I stand on their shoulders and represent them with immense gratitude and appreciation for them. Bernard, I personally doesn't, don't know what it feels like to not sleep for a month with a phone attached to my hip, to my hand, and to my ear, uh, because I'm navigating a conference change among the most transformational time in the history of collegiate athletics. Um, but I wanted to say thank you for your tireless efforts on, on behalf of our department. And I hope you had a chance to catch up on a little bit of rest and, and re reacquaint yourself with Liz. <laughs> to my fellow inductees here tonight, myself notwithstanding, what a ridiculous class. Um, it's an honor to share tonight with you. I appreciate you guys allowing me to tag along. Uh, congratulations to each of you on your well-deserved recognition tonight. Uh, a quick thank you to Art. Where are you, Art? It's, such, it's light here. Uh, and your teammates, Chris and Kamba, who are also here tonight, for bringing me and my classmates such joy during your 1998 Final Four run. It was my senior year. I still haven't forgiven Coach Gould, who's up there, uh, for not allowing us to reschedule our match against Arizona State the day you guys played in San Antonio in the Final Four. Uh, Coach said we've, we had business of ourselves to take care of in Tempe. And uh, we got through that match with a win, went to a restaurant and had a blast watching you guys battle Kentucky in overtime. Um, but it was amazing memories there. Uh, while I understand my fellow inductees and I are being recognized for our contributions here as student athletes, uh, I've also had the good fortune of being back on campus now full time as a coach for nearly 10 years. I see and have seen several of my coaching colleagues uh, currently coaching here at Stanford uh, here tonight, and I just wanted to take the opportunity to tell them that I consider it the ultimate privilege to call you colleagues, to call you mentors, and to call you friends. I learned from my coach, Dick Gould, that coaching is a sacred responsibility. And I know that you all feel the same way because I see how you work with your team members in the broader Stanford community every day. It's an absolute honor for me to be on this unpredictable, incredibly challenging, yet utterly rewarding journey with the finest group of men and women I can imagine. And no one more so than my associate and dear friend, Brandon Koop. In the weeks since Bernard called me to tell me about this evening, I've had the opportunity to reflect a bit on the qualities that have made me so proud to be affiliated with Stanford Athletics and examples of those qualities in action. Without question to me, Stanford is at its best when we're demonstrating bold leadership. I think about a quarterback in Indianapolis who worked his tail off to get, achieve the top of his field in one of the most high profile and competitive professions and jobs in the world, and then had the courage to make a decision in the best interest of physical, mental, and familial health. I've seen Stanford at its best when we're demonstrating an insatiable appetite to learn, to innovate, to achieve our best, to be entrepreneurial, and to never rest on our laurels. I think about the coach for whom I played here at Stanford, Dick Gould, a man who won 17 NCAA championships in his 38 years of service. And yet, despite his unprecedented success year after year, he was always first to try new things. He was always first to innovate. He was never afraid to fail, always looking for solutions, more often than not innovative ones. And he was willing to fail so long as he and his teams were willing to put it all on the line. Thanks for being here tonight, Coach. I think about inspiring champions in life, and I recall sitting in this room several years ago at our end of, the, end of the year awards banquet, which we have every year, and several years ago I recall listening to Maggie Steffens at the time, the women's water polo captain, 
And I recall her telling her, telling her classmates to live your legacy during your time on the farm. I was blown away by her poise, her leadership, and maturity. And as we navigate this unprecedented and transformational time in colleg collegiate athletics, indeed everywhere on campus, I'd hope that we can all consider these values to be both foundational and uncompromising and commit to doing everything we can to preserve them as we move forward. When I look back on my playing career at Stanford, what I remember is how much fun I had. The feeling of camaraderie on the team, the joy on the Stanford campus, and the friendships forged that have proven to last a lifetime, as evidenced by Ben and Kristen flying in from out of town to be here tonight. I also, <laughs> I also remember being on campus and, have the and having the flexibility to make mistakes and to learn and to grow from them. And as I see my current team members here tonight, and I appreciate you fellows being here, my most fervent wish is that students on campus today are able to have that same experience. And I'd encourage us all to think about how we can use our platform as coaches and as campus leaders to create an environment that not only gives these students an, an elite athletic experience, but also a meaningful, fulfilling, and joyful personal one. It's an immense and important opportunity before us and I know that Stanford is capable of being up to the task and leading. And finally, to my family, who have sacrificed so much for me over so many years, thank you. I came to understand a long time ago that those around me have and continue to put their own interests aside in order for me to uh, uh, pursue my passion. And I also came to understand that in addition to saying thank you, for recognizing those selfless efforts, the way to honor that sacrifice was to put my best energy investment into whatever I was doing. Otherwise, what a disservice it is to the people who are sacrificing for you. To my mom and dad who flew from the East Coast to be here this weekend, thank you for being my moral compass, for your countless sacrifices, for being the world's greatest grandparents, and for being the example of how I strive to parent. To my wife and fellow Stanford alum, Abby, the superhero in this room, thank you for your limitless patience, compassion, and intelligence, how you managed to simultaneously run your own business while being a constant present in the presence in the lives of our children and a thought leader for me and so many others while also running our household is beyond me. But know that my respect, appreciation, and admiration is matched only by my abiding love for you. And I promise I'm working on my selective hearing To Sadie, Maggie, and Charlie, thank you for bringing me profound joy and purpose. A parent's greatest joy is watching your children grow, evolve, and mature. I'm so proud of the person each of you are becoming. I love our Sunday dinners and our runs to the ice cream afterwards. Your mommy and I love you unconditionally and will always have your back. Thanks. Goldstein. Sixth member of our class is Lauren Lappin. Achieving success at every level of the sport, Lauren was one of Stanford's most recognizable players during a key stretch in the program's history. A two-time All-American, Lauren led the Cardinal to the NCAA Women's College World Series semifinals in 2004 back-to-back -back NCAA Super Regional appearances in 2005 and 2006, and an NCAA Regional berth in 2003. An all-tournament selection in the 2004 Women's College World Series, Lauren batted five for seven with a home run. Lauren directed Stanford to the 2005 Pac-10 title, which remains the only conference championship in school history for now. That conference success was reinforced as a two-time Pac-10 Defensive Player of the Year and an all-Pac-10 selection during each of her four seasons while qualifying for the first team three times from 2004 to 2006. Lauren still ranks fourth in school history in career assists with 511 and sixth in career runs scored with 168. 
She was also an Olympic medalist claiming silver in 2008 as a member of Team USA. Lauren is the fourth Hall of Fame inductee from softball following up Ashley Hansen in 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lauren Lappin. Wow, this is unbelievable. And I was about to throw in uh, a profanity in there just because I'm completely overwhelmed by this entire experience. <laughs> Apparently it would have been appreciated, so I should have just gone for it. But um, I, before I get into my probably excessively long written speech, um, I'm sitting over there and we're only halfway into this thing and I'm blown away by the fact that I didn't overlap, overlap with any of the inductees who have spoken and um, everything I relate to. And I think that that just speaks to what Stanford University is all about and what this athletic department is all about. Um, it is transformational and I just, I just feel incredibly, incredibly honored to be up here and in front of you all tonight and alongside all of the inductees. That being said, I'll just dive right in. Um, I wanna thank my coaches, trainers, doctors, academic advisors, professors, SIDs, field crew, donors, I think you get the point that the list goes on. Um, I'm fortunate enough now to work in college athletics, and so um, I now have a true understanding of how many people work behind the scenes for the success of the student athletes. Um, that was lost on me in college. So there are so many hundreds. Um, Jenny Claypool was the first person I saw when I walked in. She's someone who's still holding it down in this department. So thank you to everyone who worked behind the scenes. It is not lost on me that I am standing up here tonight for so many reasons and circumstances that were far beyond my control. I did not get to choose my relentlessly supportive family, nor the fact that I was obsessed with competition and winning for as long as I can remember. I just so happened to be born in an era which female athletes got to benefit from the enactment of Title IX. When I, yes. When I think about how this happened and why I'm up here tonight, I am completely overwhelmed by the people, moments, and opportunities that stand right here on, with, uh, with me on this stage. Excuse me. The first person I would like to thank is here tonight and was the first softball player I ever idolized. Without question, she is the reason I became a Stanford Cardinal. I'm gonna shake and quiver a lot in, with emotion, so, so bear with me, please. Uh, I was just about eight years old when my cousin Kelly Wigginton, now Farrah Misco, and our Fresno Force softball team started playing in tournaments down in Southern California, where I'm from. I was a freckle-faced, dirty-kneed <laughs> little tomboy who just loved playing all the sports all the time. When I first watched Kelly play softball, I was hooked. It was the first time I had been exposed to women competing at such a high level and with the same intensity that burned inside of me. A few years after those first summers watching Kelly play, she signed with Stanford. Shortly after that, she was in the Cardinal uniform, starting every game behind the plate and becoming an All-American. I am six years younger than Kelly. I could see her, therefore I could be her. Thank you, Kelly, <laughs> for paving the way for your little cuz, for playing with a passion that I so deeply connected with, and for always setting the best example and the highest standard. You are one of the greatest to ever wear a Stanford softball uniform. <laughs> Lonnie Alameda and Sarah Pickering were Stanford uh, assistant coaches my freshman year. Um, I'm not sure I've ever told them this, but I really believe that those two completely changed the trajectory of my entire career. When I was being recruited to Stanford, I was a catcher uh, who could play some infield, and uh, they had a gap. They had just, they were graduating Robin Walker, who was a hell of a shortstop. And uh, they had, for two more years, um, a pretty stud catcher in Jessica Allister, who might, may or may not still be here. I know she's got some big recruits on, in town. Um, but they wanted me to fill that gap, and I was not ready. Where the heck am I in this thing? There we go. Um, over the course of only one fall, Kocha and Pick turned me into a shortstop and made me believe that I could be great. 
I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was selected to the Olympic teams because of my versatility and my ability to both catch and play infield at a high level. And the latter is undoubtedly because of them. You two set the foundation for me to have opportunities to play beyond college and well into my prime. And for that, I am forever indebted to you. Thank you to Coach John Rittman. I have to say, he's like family to me. Obviously, I told the story about my older cousin Kelly having played here. Um, I was a kid when, when she played here, and uh, I came to camps, and I came to a lot of games. And so I knew him and his family well before the recruiting process. There was a level of comfort and familiarity with him that I wouldn't have gotten in any other head coach. I mean, he, uh, at a time when our family was going through some tough stuff, my grandmother had just had a pretty severe stroke and was transferred up here actually to Stanford Hos Hospital. She hadn't remembered a lot of her family, most of her family. Um, my mom included, my, her brothers, um, her own husband, but in walks Coach Rittman to her hospital room and she opens her arms and says, Coach! <laughs> Thank you, uh, sorry. <laughs> Coach, you knew how, how I ticked, how to push me and get the most out of my potential as a softball player. You are always authentically you. You gave me some of the best advice when I needed it most. Before the Olympic tryouts, you said to me, hey, just be you, that is enough. That has stuck with me for the past 20 years of my life and it is a message that I try to convey on a daily basis to my athletes. I speak for so many Stanford softball players, a lot of whom are in this room. Yeah, softball, way to represent. <laughs> when I say thank you, you gave me and all of us the opportunity to play and study at Stanford University. You took this program and put it on the map, prepared us and made us believe that we could compete with the winning winningest programs our sport had seen, and we did just that. Thank you for seeing something great in me and never letting me settle for anything less. I love you and I'm always your biggest fan, even though you now are a Clemson Tiger. So it seems obvious and even cliche to say that I wouldn't be getting this honor without my teammates, but I really wouldn't. Dana Sorensen, she's a Hall of Famer and she's here tonight. Dana, you probably wish you never stepped onto that skateboard and tore your ACL. <laughs> But I gotta say, I'm pretty thankful to have gotten that extra year to play behind you in the circle. You put the team on your back and led us to the co uh, Women's College World Series again. Laura Steves, thank you for being my wing woman for four years and becoming like a sister to me. I know your dad is looking down tonight with so much pride and definitely a lot of tears. Chinger, Diggs, Leah, Lindsay Key, Agabau, each of you made me better. Chinger, both as my counterpart at second base and also my coach for three years. You made me a better human and a better player and we had a heck of a lot of fun along the way. Hoff, where do I start? <laughs> you were literally the quintessential Stanford student athlete. You were greatness while you were here and you have been greatness every day since. Thank you for always showing up for me, especially in our post-college years. My life's path took me to St. Louis at the right time and I am so thankful for that. You are family, and you better know that I always got you in G. Tori and Alistair, give it up for the Stanford softball coaches who are here tonight. Yes. You guys are awesome. Um, I must say, I'm going to go off script a little bit here. So I, I now coach at the University of Arizona. We won't say it again the rest of the night, I know. Um, but I hadn't really gotten to spend much time with those two in a long time. Um, and now recruiting against them, unfortunately, for a lot of the same kids. Um, I get to sit at a lot of softball games over the fall and summer months and just hang with them. And it's been really, really great to reconnect with you both. But um, you're awesome. And the way you're leading this program to being a national contender again is amazing. I would be lying if I said it doesn't feel some sort of way competing and recruiting against you guys and the Cardinal. Um, but I honestly have the utmost respect for what you've been able to do in such a short time. And I may wear a different block letter now, but trust me, I am a proud Stanford softball alum forever, and I'm rooting for you guys. A lot of people say it takes a village. Well, I was raised by one, a small portion of whom are in this room representing. We roll deep, always have, always will. We joke that it's Lappin' party of 30. <laughs> Same goes for the Wigginton side. Remember when I said that I stand here tonight for many reasons beyond my control, my family is the reason I am here. Grandma Goose, Granddad, Grandma Lap, 
You are no longer with us, but you live in each of us in all the ways. I know that you are looking down tonight with bursting hearts, giant smiles, and tears of pride. You believed in us unconditionally and drove all over the country watching us play. I'm lucky to have been loved by you, and I would not be here without you. And I guess you made the right decision for us, Grandma Goose. Mans. Uh-oh, no, I skipped. Archie. We'll start with him since he, he's not here. My big brother. I wish you could be here tonight, but there you go again, just killing the dad game. He's at his uh, son's football game, and they're on a plane right now, so they can be here later tonight and then here for the football game tomorrow. But um, if Kelly Kay was my, my softball idol, you were my first hero. I wanted to be just like you. Actually, I wanted to be better than you, so thank you for doing everything in your power to try not to not let that happen. Uh, this guy would beat his five-year younger sister in ping pong or wiffle ball or anything and then talk smack to her about it. She was five. That was me. He would take his 13-year-old sister out in the front yard to catch passes for him while he trained to be a college quarterback. But he also threw the softball around with me, and he went to the biggest recruiting tournaments of my life to support me. You are a special human arch. And I am so lucky to have been raised with an older brother with such high integrity and unwavering loyalty. Easton and Emma, there they are, the cutest little nuggets in the room. I don't know, I've seen a lot of cute ones. <laughs> I am so glad you're here tonight and representing your big brothers, Kyle and Jackson. The four of you are what it's all about. You are the most amazing young humans with the best hearts. Always believe in yourself and be you. Your Auntie Lolo loves you. All right, now, Mans, I almost skipped right to you. I guess I was excited to get to that. Amanda, my big sis, uh, if anyone wants to know who really toughened me up, it was her, for sure. <laughs> Amanda, you are the most fiercely loyal person I know. You have been through it all, and you stand taller with every move you make. You are all goose, a side of fleen, and the perfect combination of mom and dad. No matter what, you have always shown up for me. Every memory I have of big moments in my life, you were there. You showed mom and dad, and me for that matter, how to navigate my coming out process. I never reached my full potential as an athlete or as a human until I was able to be my most authentic self. I owe a lot of that to you. You are my sister, my friend, my greatest ally, and I love you so much. Hannah, you are on the other side of the world right now, but you are always in my pocket. Thank you for being my partner in this life and my biggest fan. Mom and Dad, I, I promise it'll end soon, okay guys? Mom and Dad, I know how proud you are tonight. What I hope you also know is that you did this in every possible way. You sacrificed so much of yourselves for us kids and for my big dreams. Mom, you are the strongest and most badass woman I know. You taught me that no job was beneath me, that people and how you treat them are the most important parts of business and life, and that I can go my entire life without ever figuring out how to properly manage my time and still be successful. <laughs> really though, Mom, you are the rock and you are the light. You make everything happen for all of us, and you'll be damned if you can't find a way to get it done. Thank you for showing me how to show up. Dino, my dad, my coach. You were my coach from when I was 11 until I came to Stanford. I am so thankful you said yes to taking over our travel softball team after being a baseball football guy your entire life and not knowing what you'd do with young girls. What made you a great coach was that you knew how to push, but you knew how to love. You are a teacher at your core of the game and of life and of math, but that's not the point tonight. I'm glad that one hit. Good job. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> uh, Dad, you were the hardest on me. Thank you for that. And thank you for so seamlessly transi transitioning back to being my dad once I got to Stanford. You taught me that every day is a new opportunity to get better, that the little things are the big things, to always play with passion and heart. Really, the lessons learned from you are endless. When I am coaching, <laughs> I hear things come out of my mouth that you said to our team 25 years ago. You've shaped me into the coach and person I am today. You both have, Mom and Dad. I am so proud to be your daughter. 
Our last name will forever be in the Stanford Hall of Fame, and that is because of you. You know, when I was making my college decision, I can't even tell you, I think other people can relate, but I can't even tell you how many people said to me, you'd be crazy to pass up the opportunity to get a Stanford degree. I'm pretty sure now that I'm a college softball coach, um, I'm not exactly putting that degree to use. <laughs> but the experiences that I had being a Stanford student athlete have stayed with me and changed me for the rest of my life. Um, congratulations to all of tonight's inductees. I am absolutely honored to be amongst you all and to be in the Stanford Hall of Fame. Thank you. I'm Lauren Lappin. <laughs> Let's take it to the hardwood. Our next inductee is Arthur Lee. <laughs> the first Stanford basketball player to grace the cover of Sports Illustrated, Arthur's successful career was synonymous with one of the most notable moments in school history. Art led Stanford to four NCAA appearances, highlighted by an appearance in the, NC, in the 1998 NCAA Final Four down in San Antonio. Cardinal reached that stage thanks to individual heroics from Art, who scored 13 of Stanford's final 17 points over the final 205 against Rhode Island in the 1998 NCAA Regional Final, helping the Cardinals secure that trip. Madsen stuffed it, but Art Lee helped win it. No doubt about that. Named an AP honor, um, Honorable Mention All-American as a senior in 1999, Arthur was also a member of that year's Pac-10 championship team in addition to being a two-time all-conference pick. Simply put, Art automatic from the free throw line. Ranking third in school history and career free throw percentage, led the Pac-10 in free throw percentage during his junior and senior seasons, and produced a stretch of 46 straight made free throws during NCAA tournament play. Art is the 43rd Hall of Fame inductee for men's basketball and the first since Josh Childress in 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Art Lee. Dobroveče i hvala puno. That's uh, Croatian. I think I said uh, good evening and thank you very much. Is that right, Maya? Okay. Okay. My wife is Croatian, so I had to give her a shout out there. I love you, Maya. Listen, y'all, I, I, I don't have a speech. Uh... <laughs> In fact, <laughs> In fact, my family and I, my daughter, Leilani, I love you so much, big girl, and my wife, Maya, we drove uh, from Naperville, Illinois, to uh, Marin uh, County in June. And I just started a new job uh, at the Branson School. I'm the director of human development and wellness. And listen, I worked yesterday. And uh, <laughs> so listen, I'm just thankful to be here. And uh, congratulations to everybody. I, I have a few stories, maybe, um, but <laughs> let me tell you this. Coach Jay, no, Coach Johnson is up there. He, he mentioned this to me, and he, he read my mind. When Mr. Uh, Bernard Muir called me, uh, my wife and I and my daughter, we were sitting by the pool in our new community. I saw his name, or I heard his message. He sent a message, and I called him back. I told you, Chris, remember I said, Bedar Mira called me. What do you think that's about? I, yeah. I thought he was calling me for a job. <laughs> you, you don't know how many applications I put in at Stanford over the last few years. Lord have mercy. I'm, I'm still waiting for a call. I'm still waiting for a call. No, no, uh, thank you all. Listen, you don't, you don't know what it took 
um, for me to be standing here before you. Um, in January of 2022, I believe, uh, I almost died of COVID pneumonia. Yeah. Uh, thank God for my wife. Uh, she was there to help me. Uh, I didn't want to go to the hospital. I just figured I'd be all right because I rarely ever get sick. And at one point, I just couldn't breathe. I uh, went to the, the steps in our place, and uh, her and my daughter, Leilani, were going to take me to the, uh, to the hospital. But I just told her, please, just, just call the ambulance because uh, I couldn't catch my breath. And uh, thank God uh, for the ambulance fire department. Whew. They got me there, so here we are. So when I say... <laughs> Oh, I see Heather. Heather knows I apply for a bunch of jobs. How you doing, Heather? I talk, I, I, yeah, I communicate with Heather. Uh, <laughs> so when I say I'm, I'm happy to be here, I truly, truly mean it. Listen, there's some wonderful, wonderful people in this room. Uh, congratulations to all my fellow inductees. Thank you, uh, Paul, for that shout out. Now, I hope I can, can call out everybody who's here. Listen, um, I played on a wonderful team. Um, my man Chris Weems, uh, been my friend since Stanford, uh, was my teammate, roommate, and I thank him for all that he uh, did for me, helped me to make it through a time when I wasn't even playing at Stanford. There was a time when I was, uh, we won a, a tournament uh, a freshman year. It was a Christmas tournament, and everybody got called out to come to, the, to, to receive their award, ribbon, watch, or something. And when I tell you, when they called my name, all I wanted to do was run and hide because I got a DNP. Those who know about, you know, sports or basketball, or that, that means did not play. <laughs> and um, so standing here to be inducted in the Stanford Hall of Fame means a great deal to me. Um, but first, let me see. Help me out if I miss Chris. Listen, I want to say thank you to, of course, Chris Weems, my man Combachoni, my man C-Town, Mark Seaton is here. Um, any other teammates here? I think that's, that's it for my teammates, right? I need you again, man. Okay. <laughs> that's all you saw, I think. Coach Montgomery, Coach Johnson, Coach Doug Oliver, Coach Larson, uh, John Platts, uh, Jay-Z, Jamie Zaninovich. I know he's studying Croatian, too. Maybe we can work together on that one. <laughs> um, who else did I miss? Bobby V. I don't know if I mentioned Bobby V. Bobby V gave me a shout-out on LinkedIn, so I thank you for that. Yeah. Um, listen. Coach Montgomery was, um, he may not know it, but Coach Montgomery, at a, there was a time when he always mentioned uh, throughout, throughout our practices, uh, before practice, he always said, you don't want to get too high, don't want to get too low, you essentially want to stay even keel. And that always, always stuck with me and resonated with me. And now uh, I work at the Branson School in Ross, California as the Director of Human Development and Wellness. And I, I always had an issue uh, in my life you know, honestly dealing with uh, anxiety. Just from trying to perform, trying to be perfect, trying to get all A's. And who's perfect? There is no such thing as perfection. So just trying to be the very best that I could be always um, caused me to feel that sense of anxiousness. And that always resonated with what Coach Montgomery said. So I just want to thank him for being here. Um, I know he's moving to Southern California, so I thank all of my coaches, all of my teammates. My family, and I'm about to get out, I promise y'all. <laughs> Autumn, listen, Autumn, I thank you. My, my brothers and sisters, Autumn uh, and Austin, they inspired me to get my master's degree. Those young, young folks, those young leads, they got their master's before I did. I'm the older brother, but they inspired me to get it, so thank y'all. Uh, my sister, Portia, she inspired me to stand up to my father when he wanted me to go overseas at a time when I didn't want to play anymore. I played 13 years overseas, but I thank you for that, Portia. <laughs> my, <laughs> my niece, Paige, my nephew, Sebastian, my bonus mom, Pam. Thank you for being here, Pam. A lot of times, I don't know if you ever had step-parents or, or stepchildren. Pam always took me in just like her, uh, I was her own, and I thank her so much for it. Thank you, Pam. Love you. My father, if any of you know my father, um, he's here, <laughs> you know? God bless my father. You know, honestly, my father, you know, life, my parents had me, God bless my mother, she's not here. I love you, mama, I hope she's watching on, uh, on uh, YouTube. I love you, mama, I wish you could be here. 
Uh, my brother Herman is not here as well. We grew up together, uh, South Central Los Angeles. You don't know what it took for me to be here, y'all, so I thank you. But my father, um, he came back into my life at a time when I really needed him. Uh, my parents had me when they were young, teenagers. I'm from South Central Los Angeles, Compton, California. Um, I could have been anywhere. So the odds of me standing here are infinitesimal. Is that a good enough word for you, Pam? That's a good one? Yeah. So I'm extremely thankful. He helped me become a man. A um, lot of ups and downs, but I love him dearly. Anybody went to the games know he used to always scream automatic. Um, and he's living inside his happiness now, and I'm trying to do the same. Uh, I got about 30 seconds, y'all, so don't even worry about it. My wife, uh, Maya, Maya Lee, I met her at a time in Croatia when I didn't know what to do. I was over there finally earning some money, um, alone, a bit sad. I thought when I finally got some money that everything was going to be great. It, anyone who has money knows it's just not the cure-all. But I'm so thankful for my wife. She helped me become a better man. Uh, I'm still learning. I'm still growing. She's my life partner. We think the same thoughts. She finishes my sentences. Uh, and I love you dearly, Maya, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more. My, my baby girl, Leilani Lee. I love you, champion girl. Oh, thank you. Listen, I, 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 don't, I don't want to end with anything really heavy, but it's just the, the God's honest truth. When I say you don't know what it took for me to be here, uh, several years ago there was a time in my life when um, things weren't going how I thought they should be going. And I actually wrote a note, put it under our coffee table with our life insurance information. Um, yeah, I was ready to check out. But uh, I thought about my family, I thought about my daughter, and I couldn't imagine her living without me in her life and me seeing her grow up to be the wonderful young lady that she is. But I'm good now, y'all, so it's all, it's all right. <laughs> Listen, it's a celebration. I love y'all, thank you. about that? And Art, whether you get a gig here on the farm or not, eventually you'll always have an office at Arriaga because your, your plaque will be right there in the, in the home of champions, so you'll always have that. Let's get to the eighth member of our class, Melissa Seideman. Like many of the biggest names in women's water polo, it of course all started at Avery Aquatic Center. That place has been the home of so many champions. Melissa's certainly one of them. A member of two NCAA championship teams while also delivering two runner-up finishes, Melissa was a four-time All-American, one of 15 players in school history to earn the recognition in all four seasons. In 2013, Melissa was the Peter J. Catino Award recipient and Player of the Year, highlighting a senior season in which she scored 75 goals, the fourth best single season mark in school history. A four-time All-MPSF honoree, Melissa immediately gained attention in conference play as the 2009 MPSF Newcomer of the Year, scoring 59 goals. An ACWPC Academic All-American, Melissa's 239 goals, ranked second, tied for second, in school history. Melissa's international playing career was spectacular. She captured three Olympic gold medals as a leader with Team USA in 2012, 2016, and in 2020. Melissa is the fifth Hall of Fame inductee from women's water polo, following up Margie Dingledine in 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Melissa Seideman. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you for this incredible honor of being inducted into the Stanford Hall of Fame along such an incredible class. Congrats to all the other inductees this evening. This honor has offered me the opportunity to reflect on my Stanford career and it fills me with gratitude. I'm reminded of a memory that was monumental in my journey as an athlete. During conversations with my Stanford coaches, who are still currently uh, Stanford coaches, uh, John Tanner and Susan Ortwine, um, while I was being recruited, we talked not only about college water polo, but it was um, about my goals beyond college as well. I vividly remember one of the conversations JT asked me what I wanted to accomplish in the sport, and it was one of the first times I spoke my dream of becoming a 2012 Olympian. JT and Suze supported me in this goal in every way, uh, from developing my skills, pushing my mental and physical limits, and supporting my travel with the national team while I was still a Stanford athlete. Without them, um, I don't think I'd be a three-time Olympic gold medalist. <laughs> Uh, Stanford was the place that allowed me to express my passion through play, not just in the water, but all over campus. I was admittedly, admittedly intimidated when I committed to Stanford, but I'm so incredibly grateful that I did. What this place has to offer um, was the perfect place for me to grow into the woman I am today. Uh, it, this is an athletic honor, uh, but attending Stanford was so much more to me than that. Uh, the community that I built around myself here was vibrant, passionate, and supportive. They were my biggest fans day in and day out, and I'm so thankful uh, for all my friends uh, on campus. Not to exclude my teammates, uh, what a wonderful community we built. I have two of them up in the stands over there. I know more who are on campus right now, um, and so many that I could name, uh, but it's just such an amazing place to grow up. Um, with such amazing teammates. I want to say thank you to the entire athletic department for supporting my strong-willed free spirit um, and a special thank you to JT, Susan, and Kyle who were my coaching staff for all five years. Um, you always found a way to lift me up and empower me. Um, and finally, thank you to my family. Uh, your unconditional love is what powered my journey. That's it. Thank you. Once again, Melissa Seidemann. Our next inductee is Tom Wilkins. Like many of the all-time greats from the men's swimming and diving program, Tom has enjoyed team and individual success, followed by a star-studded international career. Tom was a member of the 1998 NCAA championship team following two runner-up finishes as the Cardinal placed among the top four in each of his seasons. 13-time All-American, also a five-time NCAA individual champion, one of only three swimmers in school history to win at least three NCAA titles in the same season. Tom led the Cardinal to four Pac-10 team titles and finished his career as a 10-time Pac-10 champion. He was also named the Pac-12 to the Pac-12 All-Century team in 2016 as part of the conference's centennial celebration. Internationally, Tom was a world champion and American record holder in the 400 individual medley and a 16-time United States national champion. Tom's career also includes an Olympic medal, claiming bronze in the 200 individual medley in 2000 with Team USA down in Sydney. Tom is the 36th Hall of Fame inductee and the first since Kurt Grote from men's swimming and diving. Please welcome Tom Wilkins. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Troy, that was a, a really humbling introduction. I appreciate that. I want to thank Bernard Muir and the Stanford Athletic Department for this incredible honor, and also the Hall of Fame uh, Selection Committee for 
considering me someone that's worthy of this recognition today. And I'd also like to thank the organizers for including pictures of me with hair. <laughs> I know my kids, I did have hair at one point. <laughs> um, congratulations to all the other award recipients tonight. Uh, your stories and your credentials are incredible and your comments were heartwarming. So thank you for sharing those with us today. I really appreciate that. Um, I can't begin to tell you how special this is for me. Um, the only thing missing tonight is the presence of my Stanford coach, Skip Kenny, who died this past year, um, which was a sad event for all of us. You know, Skip took a chance on recruiting a, a skinny, dorky kid from New Jersey who had an allergy to chlorine. <laughs> right? You know, I was a kid who wore big glasses you know, uh, my freshman year, and I had to leave him in the locker room, and I couldn't even find my way around the pool deck. Um, um, you know, I had a slim chance of making the travel squad my freshman year, and no less even to think about being on the Pac-10 championship team and an NC2A championship team. Um, you know, I have so much to thank for Skip for, for taking um, a chance on me, and I, I can't believe he's no longer with, with us, and I can't believe that my first meeting with Skip was 30 years ago, on my recruiting trip. Um, your meeting with Skip Kenny wasn't in his office over in Arriaga. It was actually him picking you up in his car at one of the freshman dorms that you were staying with on your recruiting trip and taking you for a drive along the foothills outside of Stanford, this beautiful place. And I remember distinctly Skip telling me on that drive that your choice of where you go to college is gonna be the second most important and consequential decision you make in your life besides who you choose to marry. Um, so if Skip were here tonight, I would look at him and tell him of those two choices, the one to come to Stanford and the one to marry my beautiful wife, Stephanie, my amazing partner in life, I nailed those decisions. <laughs> um, you could say that the choice to come to Stanford set off a chain of events that led me to where I'm standing today. And looking back on it, I can say that Skip was absolutely right, although not necessarily for the reasons that I thought of back then. At that time, I thought that with enough hard work, with passion and persistence, you could achieve whatever you wanted. Um, and while those traits are extremely important, I think that the people you're surrounded by and the environments that you are a part of have much greater impact on what you achieve and more importantly, who you become. That's why the decision to come to Stanford was so consequential, because the environment and culture here made me better. I came to swim on a team that had NC2A champions, Olympians, and world record holders, and was surrounded by the smartest people in the country and learning from the most accomplished professors in the world. That culture and all those people had a profound impact on me, and I'm so thankful for that. I'm thankful for my coaches, Skip, Ted, Pablo Morales. I'm thankful for my Stanford swimming class, my class. Scott, Jed, Chris, Sabir, Carl, Andre. This is an amazing group of men with the highest caliber of character that I've ever been around. I'm thankful for my Stanford swimming mentors and role models. Most specifically, Brian Redderer, who is a fellow Hall of Fame member, and my brother-in-law, so married my sister. And also Kurt Grote. I can never thank you enough for the leadership and the example that you guys gave to me. You know, I'm thankful for all my other teammates. So many of them are here today. You know, Pierce, Jones, Blake, and everyone else that I swam with. I'm truly grateful for everything you gave to me and the team. And I'd also like to acknowledge the current Stanford swimmer, Dan Chemmel, who uh, you know has been very supportive of me. Um, you know, and, I, and he's really taking the program into a, another great direction. Um, when I came to Stanford, my coach told me that when you become part of this team, you stand on the shoulders of all the great swimmers and all the people that came before you. And I just want Dan to realize that can you share that moment, uh, that, that, that comment with your team and let them know that we're here to shoulder the weight, you know, of their future successes. Um, of course, though, the biggest influence and impact on me is and was and is my family. Um, I'm indebted to my mother and father for all the sacrifices they made for me and for always fostering an environment where I knew that I'd always be loved 
and, they, and that they would always support me no matter what. Um, my mom and dad were my idols, and I just want to thank you for everything. In, in, ter in terms of support, I couldn't have a bigger support network than my two great older sisters, uh, Lynn and Christine. You guys have always been there for me, and thank you for that. Of course, the most special thing about this evening is that I'm blessed to be sharing it with my wife, Stephanie, my son, Bryce, and my daughter, Casey. You three will always be the most important part of my life. Stephanie, thank you for the happiness, humor, and love that you bring to our marriage and my life, and for your unconditional su support. I love you with all my heart and always will. <laughs> Bryce and Casey, I'd like to finish tonight with a message to you. You really are the most incredible blessing that mom and I could have ever hoped for. We love that both of you live with a passion that is clearly visible when you're doing things that you love and then when you're with people that you care about. Never be afraid to pursue the things that you're passionate about and always be proud to be passionate about what you love. Thank you everyone so much for this amazing honor and congratulations again to all the other honor honorees tonight. Tom Wilkins, everyone. One thing I want to do really quickly before we get to our final inductee, I certainly want to acknowledge uh, the efforts of the folks who helped put this fantastic event together. Uh, Jen Chow and crew up top helped make sure things are running smoothly. Brian Rizzo, the comms team. KJ and her team helping to make things run smoothly and to keep the MC on track and online, which is not an easy thing to do, but certainly very much appreciated. So big time round of applause for those folks who helped put, to get, helped put all this together. Thank you. All right, our next and final inductee really needs no introduction, but I'll give one anyway. He led the Cardinal to a 31 and eight overall record in three bowl games, the 2009 Sun Bowl, the 2011 Orange Bowl and the 2012 Fiesta Bowl, including a 40 to 12 route of Virginia Tech in the Orange Bowl. He threw for 287 yards and four touchdowns. What a night in Miami that was. The resume is unmatched. Two-time Heisman Trophy runner-up, Maxwell Award winner, Walter Camp Football Foundation Player of the Year Award winner, Johnny Unitas Golden Arm Award winner, a first-team All-American in 2011, also a two-time Pac-10 Offensive Player of the Year, one of five players in conference history to win the award twice. He established career records for the school with 31 wins, 82 touchdowns, over 10,000 yards of total offense while securing career conference records in passing efficiency rating and completion percentage. His commitment in the classroom was equally impressive as a 2011 First Team Academic All-American and an Academic All-American of the Year. He was eventually selected as the number one overall pick of the Indianapolis Colts in the 2012 NFL Draft, completing for, competing for six seasons until 2018. During that time, he was a four-time Pro Bowler, passing touchdowns leader in 2014, and the Comeback Player of the Year in 2018. He is the 97th Hall of Fame inductee from football and the first since Toby Gerhardt in 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Luck. Well, I'm, I'm also feeling some type of overwhelmed, <laughs> Lauren. This is pretty awesome. Really incredible. Thank you for the kind words, Troy. And like I realized sitting here that, and I've been back coaching high school football and freshmen a couple of days a week this year, and they're 14 year old boys and they're hilarious. I mean, you know. <laughs> and I realized I love it because like that 14 year old boy still lives in me who is just a fan of college athletes, like of Art Lee, of Joe, of Lauren, of Melissa. Like, I feel like a fan. I'm a kid in a, kid in a candy store getting Olympians. I'm so jealous of Olympians. <laughs> Gah. 
I was telling Corey earlier, like, I was like, where'd you win your gold and world championships in the four years? Like, oh, in London. I was like, oh, I played in Buffalo. I did not play. Well, I did play in London once, actually. I really forgot that. Bad experience. Wouldn't do that again. <laughs> but I'm, and, I, and I'm stoked. And, and Melissa and I were freshmen together. Uh, I, I, I know you, you know, took time off for the Olympics, but you're a class of 012. Anybody else? One more time. 012. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. That's my, you know, my friends are cringing back there. That's my Dean Julie shout out. Dean Julie was Dean, dean for us uh, as freshmen. I remember my freshman year riding my bike at like 2 a.m. from Branner, where, where the Branner boys lived, back to Robley on the other side of campus, and I saw Dean Julie smoking cigarettes outside the tea shacks. I was like, welcome to California, Andrew. This is how we do it here. This is awesome. To, to all the fellow inductees, congratulations, and it, it really is like, truly an honor. And um, like Paul, I want to go play on your team, man. Like, what, like what, what, you're, what you're sharing and what you're, what you're up here living and believing is, I think, really incredibly important. The, the other thing, and, and just now, it looked like you were wearing a sweater vest in a few of those pictures on the tennis court. <laughs> Bernard, let's get the Nike contract for a throwback you know, series against someone with sweater vests. Um, one, one, one of my regrets about my college time, perhaps the biggest regret, uh, is that I didn't go to more sporting events and competitions of my competitors. I certainly spent a fair time, uh, fair amount of time at gymnastics events, and I'll get to that later. Um, <laughs> but I didn't, and, and, and I regretted that, and, I, and I'm so thankful that second chances do exist, because I came back, we came back a year ago uh, to get a master's degree, and are living here this year, and that's all I want to do. All I want to do is load up our daughters in our trailer and bike over here and watch Susan and JT at, at women's water pole, polo and go, to, and go to tennis games and you know, see how long a three and a half year old will last at a sporting event. But, but it's amazing. And watching our three and a half year old especially, watching her watch these student athletes and these women, and especially last year with the Title IX celebration, opened my eyes to a whole new world. And when fathers are talking about their daughters up here and, and their children, I think I get it. I mean, this place, um, these student athletes and what y'all did, I guess what, what, what some of us did, I, you know, it goes, it goes a long way. And hearing you talk about your heroes, Lauren, that, that resonates. Uh, y'all are, are my heroes and, and watching my daughter watch is a powerful thing. And, I, and I'm so honored to be a part of this community and to let our children be a part of this community. It's, it's difficult to state how important Stanford is to my life, how important Stanford athletics are to my life. And, and I think, simply, I struck gold you know, when, I, when I came to this place, when they, when they let me in. Of course, best school in the world, in paradise. I got to play my sport, compete at my sport at the highest level of college, develop, had a chance to go professional. But that, like, that doesn't capture the magic, and I think the magic is what so many, so many others have talked about, is the people. The people we were around, and not just our classmates, not just our teammates, but the adults you know, in our lives here. Uh, I had unbelievable teammates who are still some of my best friends, I'm coming to them as well later, and, and I met the most important person in my life here uh, in Robley, our dorm rooms, you know, backed up against each other, and Nicole and I are married now, and went through a you know a whole lot, whole long journey to get there, um, and we joke often like, thank you Stanford Housing, the original matchmaker, Cupid.com. <laughs> you know, I think there's a I think there's a few of us talking today that have experienced similar, uh, and glad glad we made it. But you know, and and then on to sports. I, I've shared this sentiment with a few folks this week, and I'm really grateful for this opportunity for many reasons, including a, a bit of a, you know, nostalgic, but also like you can get on some deep dives on YouTube. They got awesome highlights of the Rhode Island Stanford game uh, and, and other things and, and so grateful for that. But you know, I was thinking about my recruiting class and, and what we committed to. We, you know, I think we committed to a team that went one and 11, a football team that went one and 11 and lost to San Jose State and UC Davis and Jim Harbaugh was hired. and. Uh, you know, so we, we, were, we, we had to believe in something, and, and amongst, amongst the many reasons I think a lot of us ended up coming to play football at Stanford was that, if, that, that we knew that if we wanted this place that we deserved to win, that we would, we would have earned 
every win and every positive thing that happened on the football field. And then I got on campus and realized we win all these, like we win these beautiful director's cups, director's trophies, and, and certainly the, you know, there's history of Rose Bowl in 2000 and some others, but I was like, darn, I want, I want football to contribute to one of these director's cups. Like, don't, we don't need to let everybody else pull the slack for us. And we did, and we worked our butts off, and, and, it, and it was deeply, deeply gratifying um, to sort of see the fruits of our labors. Um, after my junior season, or after my junior year, it was my second, I redshirted, it was my second year of football, someone towards after the season um, asked me if I was going to leave for the NFL. And I was, and I was legitimately surprised by the question. My, like, no, I'm not gonna leave for the NFL. And I knew I had the opportunity. I knew you, know, you could go to the NFL after three years once your eligibility was, you know, that was sort of the, the rule. Um, but it surprised me that, that I was even being asked that. And then I said, well, shoot, I better think about this. This seems like a, you know, a life decision that's worth you know, putting some thought into. Uh, and so I did, and, and came really to a laundry list of why I should stay and not many reasons for why I should leave. And my best friends were here, my girlfriend was here, my sister was, was here, I have a freshman sister who's not here today. Uh, right now, she's in Alabama. Um, I actually enjoyed school. I got to, I, I studied architecture. I, I got to draw and play with Legos, you know, and build things. <laughs> especially, like, especially like nursery school, Jenna, with, uh, with Lucy <laughs> in the classroom. Um, and I also had a lot to improve on on the football field. Uh, I knew I needed to get better, and I, and I legitimately thought that we could and would win a national championship, and I really wanted that for this university and our program. We didn't. Um, but all of that was true, uh, but more than anything, I was happy and having plain old fun, and I think a part of me knew that that wasn't gonna last forever in that way. Uh, so grateful I stayed, uh, and it gave me, it gave me a, a, a whole nother year to grow up, which I certainly needed before entering you know, the big world. Um, there are a number of quarterbacks in the Stanford Hall of Fame, unsurprisingly, and I saw Plunk here Maybe, well. Maybe John Pay is here as well, but Plunk, you can wave. Man, how awesome. I, I get to be in a, you know, a room with Jim Plunkett. And, and that's really cool. I know Todd Husek's here as well and some others. And I, and I you know, maybe sentimental, I, I feel so honored to be a part of the quarterback tradition at this place. It means a lot to me. I know it means a lot to everybody who plays as well, and, and, I, and I hope to be sitting up there when Kevin Hogan's inducted into this Hall of Fame at some point in the near future. <laughs> you know, football, uh, we've talked about some of the individual sports, you know, in team sports, Nicole talked about tennis, and, and I know my, my wife was a gymnast, and Corey, and, and track, and, and sort of the fusion of individual and team. Football is all team, <laughs> you know? And, and I do think it is the ultimate team sport. Uh, and I very much feel like this induction, you know, perhaps carries my name, but is, is representative of a whole lot more than me and a whole lot, whole lot of people uh, more than me. I'm, I'm super glad to, and honored to join Toby as sort of representatives of, of, of this era. Um, I was a young quarterback and starting my first year and scared and nervous, you know, there, there are men that play college football and and that scared me, but handing off to Toby Gerhardt was sweet. Are you kidding? Like, and that's, and that's what I did my freshman year. I handed off to Toby Gerhardt. <laughs> handed off to Toby Gerhardt. He was awesome. Toby got robbed of a Heisman. I'm not sure I got robbed of a Heisman, but I really wanted to win it and join Plunk in that. Christian got robbed of a Heisman. Bryce got robbed of a Heisman. And it's not a West Coast. I'm going to get on the soapbox. It's not a... It's not a West Coast bias. SC guys win the Heisman. It's, it's a little bit of a Stanford bias, and, and that's a big F you to everybody who votes on the Heisman. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm at the specific thank yous. Uh, but before that, again, a congratulations and a thank you to all the, 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 the inductees and all the other student athletes, you know, current, former administrators, y'all give a lot of joy to a lot of people's lives. You've given a lot of joy to a lot of people's lives, and I certainly feel that sort of cycle of sports now, volunteer coaching for two days a week of, of you know, sport gave me a lot, and it only feels right and fitting to give some back to it. So, so thank you, congratulations to you two. On the academic side, I was surprised by Jody Maxman, Tom Beischer showing up today, really cool. 
amazing professors in our school. And, um, and John Barton, a big thank you to John, who is, who is my program advisor in the, in the architecture program and a, and, a, and a Cal guy, but a huge Stanford fan, so that's good. I had, I had the good fortune of playing for unbelievable coaches. coaches. I've mentioned Coach Harbaugh. The lasting message I, I, I feel from Coach Harbaugh was, was um, you know, he, Paul talked about mistakes and failing and, 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 and having to learn that. And Coach Harbaugh, the message I internalized with him from him was it's okay to make mistakes. And I felt so empowered as a quarterback to go out there. What was not okay was repeating mistakes. <laughs> and, and, and I also internalized that. And I think another way of saying was you've got to learn, you've got to adapt. And that, that, that message certainly carried, I carried with me throughout my professional career. And then, and then Coach Shaw, who was the assistant, helped recruit me and then got the job and took this program to unbelievable heights, heights we had never seen. Um, certainly after my time, I, I loved to death and I think you know, make, make sure we all learn to hold on to our humanity while we played a sport that oftentimes doesn't reward humanity. Um, thank you to those guys. Tavita, I got to play with and coach me. There's a bunch, bunch of names to go down the list. I won't say them all, but Shannon Turley, our strength coach, you know, really helped me grow and develop. And we had a three-headed monster in our, in, our athletic, in our football side of the athletic department between Matt Doyle, Steve Bartlinski, and Gary Hazlett, which might not mean much to much, but those who were in that program at the time know, much how, know, much, know how much work folks do behind the scenes to, to let us go run out there on Saturdays. So, so forever thankful for them and everybody else in the athletic department that makes this, that makes this ship go. Uh, there's a, a number of friends in the community that that made my experience what it is. I think Mark Flynn is here. You know, families like you guys have done, have done so much, but none, none more than Liz and Chris Dressel, who housed me and, and Sam for three summers in Woodside and gave us a home away from a home, which was, which was a big deal. And you know, I'm not sure a 19, 20, and 21-year-old boy wants to admit they want to be at home with someone and have parents around, but we needed it. And we needed, that, we needed a little bit of that, that care and loving, and they gave it to us. And the high marks let my wife and I separately you know, both recover from surgeries that, that we had, which is an inevitability of, you know, of playing big sports at their homes um, in Palo Alto. Uh, my family is here, my mom and dad. And mom, we haven't talked much about this, but I can't imagine, and you shared this, watching your son play football might be fun, but it, w watching him get hit might not be so fun. So you put, up, <laughs> you put up with a lot watching this sport and game, and I always felt unwavering support and love, so thank you. Yeah, Dad, you were my hero growing up. I wanted to be, my dad went to the Stanford of the Appalachians, West Virginia University. <laughs> <laughs> and he wore number 12, you know, I wore number 12. I wanted to be like him. I wanted to be a scholar athlete. I wanted to play quarterback. I wanted to play professional. My dad got his law degree while he played professional and then retired. You know, that, like, I think now as a parent, understanding those big, big messages that not, not that our parents say, but that our parents live. And, you know, that, that was one that, that certainly, stuck with me. One of my sisters, my sister Emily is here at 2016. Stanford, 2016, did I get that right? Yeah, I got it right. Stanford grad, I appreciate your support. Uh, siblings are amazing and I think one of the joys in my life is, is uh, being adult siblings and learning about each other and becoming friends in a different way. Uh, really cool. You know, my person, I'm an older brother. I, my per I played quarterback, I tell people what to do. It, perfect, older brother, play quarterback, order, order people around. My daughters don't listen to me though and that's a problem. Um, our other sister who I mentioned, Mary Ellen, is not here. Mary Ellen's my favorite Stanford volleyball player of all time, and we'll stay that way. And our brother Addison's over in London doing his thing. He's the youngest. He gets to go, you know, wherever the wind blows. But thank you to you guys. You've, you've been there a long, you know, obviously from the very beginning, and I'm certainly appreciative and feel like I'd share this with you guys um, every step of the way. Thank you. Uh, Nicole, we met as freshmen in Robley, and we made it. We've come a long way since. Uh, and, and I'd be risk, remiss to be here in a Stanford athletics environment and not mention some of you know, my favorite Stanford fan moments for watching you doing gymnastics with grace and beauty and courage, and, and I miss watching you. Uh, and I know our daughters and I spend a lot of time on YouTube watching their mother do gymnastics. Uh, and it's, it's really special, and, I, and I, love seeing, I love seeing the current gymnasts. I love seeing their eyes when you walk into the gym and show interest in their lives and keep the cycle going. I love you very much, and we have two beautiful daughters. Uh, last but not least, and I put teammates last but not, lot, not least because they hold an incredibly important part and space in my life. I mentioned Toby. He was inducted a few years ago. It's an, it's an honor to join, join him. Um, 
And if I got to boil down the essence of what my, made my Stanford experience what it was, the sort of the magic that I talk about, the people, it's that there it wasn't just the, the people. I got to throw a football and be outside with my best friends every day, right? That, 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 that was my Stanford football experience. We worked really hard, but we had fun and we did it together. A lot of y'all flew in. I see Johnson surprised me flying in from DC, probably Chase and Baby from, from Austin. Chris is here long, not too long. Guys, Kobe's sitting over there. Don't leave him out tonight. <laughs> you surprised me by coming in from Denver. Sam's here, and there, there might be a few others that I can't see, but, but it means the world. And, and one of the things that I feel so grateful for is that those guys just show up. They show up, and we show up in each other's lives, and I think uh, showing up's a big deal, and I very much appreciate that Stanford gave me men to show up in my life. So thank you, thank you very much. Go Card. All right, one more time, another big round of applause for all of our inductees. Congratulations. Thank you all so much for all that you have done for Stanford and will continue to do in the future. What a night, eh? This was kind of cool, wasn't it? Hope you had as much fun as I did. That will conclude the program for tonight. If we can just have our inductees stick around with us, we got to take a group photo, selfies, all that kind of stuff. If we can just get you guys to stick around here for a moment with us. The rest of you guys, feel free to head back up to the lobby. There is the reception there. Have fun, all those sorts of things. Thank you so much for coming out here tonight. Hope you had as much fun as I did. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane, and go Stanford. Thanks for coming tonight. <laughs>